Vix online lecture series, lecture number 13, The Rock and Roll Revolution. If jazz music was America's first true, unique, and distinct art form, rock and roll was its younger but vastly more popular, if not somewhat less sophisticated, younger brother. Like its predecessor, rock would go through many alterations and would arise from a combination of American influences. Unlike jazz, rock has had a tough period of growth, surviving constant criticism, early deaths of its more important figures, and even trouble with the law. Rock and roll hasn't merely survived the notoriously short attention span of teens, congressional attacks and censorship, the commercial pitfalls caused by the repeated technological revolutions that used to deliver rock via radio and record to 8-track and cassette, the rise of CDs in the 90s, and the modern digital age of listening to music in the form of coded electrons on a hard drive, rock and roll has thrived in spite of these hardships. But this lecture is not intended to give you an overview of the whole history of rock and roll. That's a subject worthy of an entire class itself. In this lecture, we will look at rock in two ways. We will see how this radical form of musical expression arose in the 1950s, and we will look at the impact it had upon culture in the 1950s. Mixing up a fresh batch of rock and roll. Rock was born out of combining distinct American musical styles into one sound. Rock and roll owes its existence, simply put, to three different genres of music. Country, rhythm and blues, and blues. In this lecture, I will play some videos of early stars from each of these genres, calling your attention to specific aspects of the sound and style of music. It's my hope that after you learn where rock's roots lay, that your musical ear will change and evolve. You'll hear Ruth Brown when you listen to the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Little Richard when you listen to Little Wayne or Bono, Elvis when you listen to Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin, Jerry Lee Lewis when you listen to Billy Joel or even the White Stripes or Nirvana. Let's begin. Ingredient number one, the blues. Blues music has been around longer than jazz, evolving from the field gospel of slaves and ex-slave sharecroppers combined with the Caribbean chants and voodoo ceremonial moanings. The blues migrated into the Deep South, the New Orleans Basin at the Gulf of Mexico, and the Mississippi Delta. Artists such as Huddy Leadbelly Leadbetter forged a blues style in the 19-teens and 1920s on the 12-string acoustical guitar that combined a masterful virtuosity of his instrument along with a singing style that ranged from a forceful, near-moaning bellow to a rhythmic talking style that wouldn't be too far off from a primitive form of modern rap. Early blues musicians mostly played the guitar and the harmonica. Both instruments were cheaply mass-produced by the early 20th century and therefore easily affordable to poor blacks. The harmonica especially was attractive to pick up and play because you could do so with just one hand. And in the hands, or rather the mouth, of a skilled musician, it could wail and moan like no other instrument. Blues music was very simple in construction. It usually relied upon just three chords. The root, the fourth, and the fifth. As a result, the basics of blues was easy to learn. An experienced musical novice could play blues progressions within just a few weeks of learning the guitar. But because of all the room such simplicity created, improvisation, rhythm, and subtle chord adjustments could make mastery almost impossible to achieve. As far as lyrical themes are concerned, Blues musicians were either boasting and bragging about anything from their sexual prowess to their physical strength, or bemoaning hardship, whether done wrong by a woman, their boss, life in the Jim Crow South, or even Mother Nature herself. As heartbreaking as blues songs could be, they could also at times be funny and often very racy and explicit. Also of note, most blues musicians were male, which lent a decisively macho bias to the music. As the first great migration of African Americans began to steadily stream north, blues left with them, just as jazz did. As a result of this transplant and the development of electric instruments by the early 1940s, the blues changed dramatically. Let's watch blues legend Howlin' Wolf not only describe what blues are, but strut some of his own stuff. A lot of people wonder, what is the blues? I hear a lot of people saying the blues, the blues, but I'm going to tell you what the blues is. When you ain't got no money. You got the blues. When you ain't got no money to pay your house rent, you still got the blues. 
A lot of people holler about, I don't like no blues, but when you ain't got no money and can't pay your house rent and can't buy you no food, you damn sure got the blues. If you ain't got no money, you got the blues, because you're thinking evil. That's right. Anytime you're thinking evil, you're thinking about the blues. Especially in Mississippi, the blues permeated black culture. Electric instruments allowed guitarists more range of expression, but unlike their northern counterparts, southern blues bands were smaller and rarely featured horns. The guitarist, maybe two, a drummer, and a bass player tended to be it, unless they were occasionally joined in by a, a harmonica player. While Chicago blues tended to have a very staccato, syncopated, very noticeable rhythm, Delta Blues was a little more laid back and it had a very subtle groove to it. Let's watch a couple masters. First, John Lee Hooker performing his 1948 hit Boogie Chiller for a crowd at Berkeley, California in 1992. In this performance, there are only two guitars playing, but notice how those guitars slide around the rhythm, creating a much more relaxed groove. A groove in which you can still count out four beats per measure and tap your foot in time to. It may sound at first that the playing is sloppy, the guitar is out of tune, but that's part of the point. Blues was, in part, a rebellion against the more studious, straight-ahead playing and perfected sound of jazz, especially of white jazz. In blues music, how a guitar sounded, whether it was old and beat up, and maybe even a bit broken, was just as important as the notes it had to play. Here's Bo Diddley performing his 1957 hit, Hey Bo Diddley, in which he modestly boasts about his many skills and talents. What you need to pay attention to here is the rhythm he's playing. It has a very distinct rumba, kind of shuffle beat, almost a kind of an end part in how this may sound, bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, bump. This beat would prove irresistible to early rockers like Buddy Holly and British musicians such as the Rolling Stones. <laughs> 